seated. It always is a pleasure for me to introduce our pastor because I know that he's going to create and generate um, ideas and um, bring a message that is powerful and passionate and, and that will allow us to see the science of mind up close and personal. Friends, put your hands together and welcome our pastor, Reverend John Scott. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel like it's Valentine's Day already. The love month has begun. But every day of every month is a love expression for us at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica. So welcome to our hearts and to the sanctuary where love reigns enthroned in perpetual splendor on all our hearts, whether we are here in person or celebrating this morning's service on the World Wide Web. You know, I'm one of those fortunate people who grew up surrounded by expressions of love. My parents constantly demonstrated the way to love. So that is the title of my encouragement this morning, the way to love. There are many ways to love, yes? But the way to love used to sometimes cause my older brother Dennis and I to giggle with amusement when we thought our parents were being silly. And at other times, we would groan in embarrassment when they expressed their affection publicly. I mean, of our friends, who else, whose parents goes for walks in the afternoon, holding hands and stopping, you know, to look at a bougainvillea and smooch, you know, pecking each other on the cheek and hugging tightly. So we used to just squirm with embarrassment. Now that I'm a grown person and I look back at it, it's so romantic and so beautiful and such a demonstration of the way to love. So one Valentine's Day, Mommy gave Daddy a, a bound volume of a, a book that he treasured. It was called The Best Loved Poems of the American People. And she gave him a note and then complained bitterly to my brother Dennis and I that his, his nose was always buried in a book and namely unto it, the, the poetry book, because he loved poetry and he loved theater. But she never nagged him about it. It was never an issue for, for argument because she had a much subtler technique of getting her own way. You ladies will relate to this, I'm sure. So picture this. Daddy sitting on the veranda on a Sunday morning after church, puffing on his pipe and reading from his Valentine's book. My mom, feather duster in hand, breezes past him as she puts our already immaculate house in order. And she pauses long enough to offer him another cup of coffee and then says, Sweetheart, don't get up now, dear. That always meant not now, but in 30 seconds. Don't get up, darling, but when you have time, 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 time please face that like dripping closet 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 Without hesitation, hesitation dad, dad, dad leaps to his feet and fetches, and fetches his pan and, pan and goes, and goes to do her bidding. What's a lesson in how you, how you, you, you get what you want, eh? Twenty minutes later, or a half an hour, he's back on the veranda with the best love poems in his lap, and the pipe is already relit. Mom reappears, and perching on the arm of his chair, coos. Love me? Mm -hmm. He mutters. He's, she continues. I'm doing your favorite for lunch, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. Mm, he says, eyes glued to the book. Mom, who was never deterred by our preoccupation with other matters, asks sweetly, darling, do you want to plant those two rose plants you, you and the boys gave me for Valentine's Day on the front lawn? Or do you think we should have it on, in the back where there is more sun? She doesn't wait for an answer. She's off into the house to do some more dusting. And Daddy gets up. He goes for the garden fork. And as he's heading to the garden, he mutters, 
a thing of beauty is a job forever. <laughs> Deliberately misquoting and the, uh, Endymion, the beautiful poem by the 19th century English romantic poet John Keats. What Keats actually wrote was, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. But dad never let on whether the thing of beauty to which he referred was the house, the garden, or mommy. He was, after all, an expert at building and maintaining relationships. But I know now that a thing of beauty is both a joy and a job. I can tell you, our grounds here at the Temple of Light and our sanctuary, just so beautiful, and they are a joy. But it also takes a lot of work and planning and management to maintain them, as you will appreciate. And so I want to give kudos to, to our uh, Ministry of the Environment group, which pays such loving attention to the environment of the Temple of Light. Yes, I think they deserve a hand. So I remember well, my friends, those early lessons in friendship. And one day, though, I asked my dad why he always jumped to do mommy's bidding. She can't wait until you, until you finish reading your book or, or, or reading the papers. Why she can't wait? <laughs> Dad, smiling, puts his book aside and says, You know, son, I have noticed that when your friends next door call you, you drop whatever you're doing and rush to the fence. Well, look at it this way, boy. Mommy is my friend. Lesson learned. Years after my parents passed on, I read Dr. Gary Chapman's work on the ways people in relationships receive and give love. Chapman calls these ways the five love languages. Chapman categorizes these as physical touch, quality time, receiving gifts, words of approbation, and acts of service. And he maintains that we all respond positively to one or more of these love languages, and that when the people we are dealing with use them, speak them to us, we feel loved and appreciated and validated in the relationship. So, so suppose, for example, my primary love language is words of approbation, and my partner never praises or acknowledges the good I do. I feel, or I may feel, unappreciated and perhaps even unloved at the time. Similarly, suppose you and your partner go out for uh, an afternoon drive. You know, you're tired of being in the house on lockdown, and so you decide to take a Sunday afternoon drive out, and your partner is driving. And let us say that your partner's love language is touch, physical touch. And so as he drives along, through a, a beautiful country lane, or he or she, they reach across for your hand. And your reaction is, put your hand back on the steering wheel. You're trying to get us both killed. Keep your hand on the steering wheel now. See what has happened? Somebody just poured cold water on a warm feeling. And maybe the rest of that drive is in silence. And after half an hour, you say, something wrong there? No. Mm -mm. But that person feels rejected and unloved in the moment. And so the first part of your assignment, and you know I always give an assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is to practice the love languages in your relationships. So let me just go through them for you again. If your love language is physical touch, and I want you to do this not with your partner or your loved one, but with yourself. You know, it is easy sometimes to love the other. But we very often neglect loving ourselves. And so if your love language is physical touch, that's what makes you feel worthwhile. When you are bathing or applying lotion, just gen gently massage yourself and say your name loud and say, I love you. I really love and appreciate you. Do the physical touch for yourself. If your love language is quality time, spend some quality time with yourself. 
just carve out a little time to be with you and write a few lines in your journal regarding why you love your own company. What makes you such good company? Begin doing that for yourself. If receiving gifts makes you feel appreciated, give yourself a Valentine's gift this week. It doesn't have to be something expensive, just something nice. That, for me, it would be ice cream, but I'm trying to, uh, you know, not love myself that much. Um, but give yourself a gift. If your love language is words of approbation, daily affirm your, your worthiness and your validity and your authenticity and write it in your, in your journal. I love and approve of myself. And if it's act of service, again, you do so much for others. This week, do something special for you. You know, I did something special for myself many years ago when I decided to come to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. My, my, my good friend, my soul friend, my Anamkara, as the Irish say, Larry Chang, invited me here. And I can tell you, when I visited the temple and listened to words of wisdom just pouring from the lips of Dr. Elmer Lumsden, um, I have to say the predominant feeling was love. And I experienced it, it was almost palpable and it was quite overwhelming. And I don't remember what she spoke about, but I do remember that the responsive reading was from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Well, Reverend Emma was no tinkling cymbal, I can tell you, or no sounding brass. Love shone forth from her and seemed to radiate from the very walls of the place. At the time, you know, my friend Larry used, and I used to tease each other because he said, I, I feel a think. And I said, he thinks a feel. Which means... When I asked him a question, he would always respond cerebrally. Well, I think so and so and so. And when he asked me a question, I'd always respond from my heart and say, well, I feel so and so. So after that first uh, Sunday in 1981, we went to his house for coffee, as was our wont, on a Sunday morning. And he said, what did you um, think? Because this was his cerebral. What did you think about the message? And I said, boy, I've never been to a church where I felt so much love. He said, I didn't ask you what you felt. I asked you what you thought. So I said, oh, okay then. I thought I felt I've never felt so much love. <laughs> At the time, you know, I had just gone through a painful divorce or separation from a company of which I had been a founding member. And I was still angry and in litigation and all of that and wanting to be, to be you know, to be right. You know, we always want to be right. I remember discussing it with Reverend Emma, and she said, do you want to be, to be right? To, do you want to be justified, or do you want to do the right thing? So, you know, her guidance was just, just invaluable. And I found that love was the balm that you could pour on, I could pour, on all of my resentment and my, my bad feelings, that I could let it go because... Love was the great healer. Um, and I realized that although from childhood I, I had learned to express love in familiar and everyday exchanges of affection with family and close friends, the challenge was, how do you love? It, it was in your reading this morning, uh, Sandy. How do you love when you don't feel loving? How, how do you become love? when that's the furthest thing from ho how you are feeling, feeling, or what you are thinking in the moment. And so, after that first Sunday, listening to Reverend Elmer, First Corinthians became my go-to affirmation. And so, your second part of your assignment is this. There are 13 verses to this beautiful scripture, and your mission, your undertaking, should you decide to do it, is to write just one verse each day of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 
but you do it using your non-dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, use your left hand to write the verse. If you are left-handed, use your right hand to write the verse. It is said that when you use your non-dominant hand, you help to create new neural pathways. I dare say pathways to love if you're de dealing with 1 Corinthians 13. And that it helps to balance your left and right cerebral hemispheres. You can have great fun with it because when you do it, it really looks like a child's writing. You know, and you, you, you understand, you have a better understanding of how children learning to write you remember when you had to go, but you had to keep between the lines and, and how, how difficult it was? In fact, I, got to, I remember getting a, a slapping because I was to color between the lines of my coloring book. And I thought that it was of a bird or a duck or something flying. And I thought this with my crayon was indicating rhythm, and it was actually. But that wasn't what you had to do. You know, they forced you to, to, to think narrowly beyond the lines. Well, when you, you write with your non-dominant hand, you, you, you open up the possibilities and you will have great fun trying it. So every morning, just one verse. And remember that as you do this, you are creating a neural pathway to being more loving. Friends, love centered in self alone, appropriated only for our own satisfaction without including the highest good of others, leaves us alone and isolated from life. Fortunately, practice makes permanent. They say practice makes perfect, but I like practice makes permanent because the more you do something, the more it gets ingrained, doesn't it? It's like you, it's like you, you carve a groove in your consciousness so that that is your go-to response, that is your default position. And we can make love our default position if we practice practice, practice until it becomes permanent. So, if any kind of discord in your life calls for greater love than before, if you're tired of talking to the children or your nerves are at the breaking point dealing with an aging parent, or your grown children and you just aren't seeing eye to eye, or someone at work is really getting to you, consider this, and I quote, love is patient, and what? Kind. Is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. So we need not, my friends, be so concerned with finding out who is at fault and trying to be right all the time in our inharmonious relationships. We students of the science of mind know that we, we demonstrated the relationships that we are in, both intimate and social and work-related, and they can be powerful teachers. But we must heal any discord with that love balm, that power of love, by being patient and kind and reminding ourselves, perhaps you just pause and say, I wonder what love would do now. What would love do? And when that answer comes to you, take a deep breath and proceed along the path to love. So here's a, here's a little tip. Whenever you're faced with trying experiences or human adversities, every time you begin to feel irked by others, just what I say, pause and say, what would love do now? Ernest Holmes said, and I quote, love points the way and law makes the way possible. Because when you set your intention to act from a loving place, the law, the law of mind, the law in, it, which creates the mold into which our feelings are poured and it takes the form of our feelings and produces what we are feeling. So if you pour resentment and anger into the mold, what do you get back? Perfectly formed resentment and anger. And if you pour love, what do you get back? Perfectly formed love in every facet and relationship of your life. For you see, there are many ways and many paths to spiritual fulfillment. 
And some of those paths are detours and others may be, may be way off course. But you never need to mind, for the Science of Mind Declaration of Principles affirms that the goal of complete emancipation from all discord of every nature is sure to be attained by all. So why not let us, let us work at, at creating that reality now? I don't want to wait for some future time while I, I wallow in bad feelings and, and experiences of more and more resentment. I want to experience all the love that I'm capable of receiving and giving in the now. And so the way to love is never lonely, my friends, because it always includes others and is illumined by the light of God's love that shines from within you. It's what I experienced when I, I encountered Reverend Reverend Every, Every step, step on love's way, love's way reveals more opportunities to love more, more and share more, share more and to rejoice, and to rejoice in the companionship of spiritual, spiritual oneness. Jeanne Barnes spoke about sharing, and I think that is one of the ways to, one of the paths to love. I think we need to share more. I think we need to schedule a time with our family and our loved ones and our workers just to share. You know, perhaps before we start a meeting, if we just shared how we're feeling this morning, what's in our mind and what's on our heart, what are we feeling and what are we thinking? Take 10 minutes to do that, and it sets the tone for the relationship that you are going to be creating in that moment. So join her and Reverend Michael the following Wednesday, and they will alternate for sharing in the garden. It's, it's one way to love and to experience love at the deepest possible levels. I brought with me a poem from that book my mother gave my father in 1947. Wow, such a long time ago. 47, I was four years old. My father read from that book every night to my brother and myself. We absolutely hated it. <laughs> but he ended up being a poet, and many of those poems are stuck in my, they're in my DNA. I remember them in their entirety because I, I heard them. Instead of bedtime stories, there were poems read to us every night as we fell asleep. And so this poem is by a man called Roy Croft, and it is titled simply, Love. I love you, not only for what you are, but for what I am when I am with you. I love you not only for what you have made of yourself, but for what you are making of me. I love you for the part of me that you bring out. I love you for putting your hand into my heaped up heart and passing over all the foolish, weak things that you can't help dimly seeing there, and for drawing out into the light all the beautiful belongings that no one else had looked quite far enough to find. I love you because you are helping to make of the lumber of my life not a tavern, but a temple. Out of the works of my everyday, not a reproach, but a song. I love you because you have done more than any creed could have done to make me good, and more than any fate could have done to make me happy. You have done it without a touch, without a word, without a sign. You have done it by being yourself. Perhaps that is what being a friend means after all. Perhaps that is what being a friend means after all. Perhaps that is the way to love. Perhaps we could create a world that truly works for all if we remember that we were brought to this plane of action to be love, to express love, and to receive love. And so, my friends, now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. May your way to love be just filled with all your heart's desire.
for female love have lion heart. Strong and everlasting, only for you. Namaste.